Okay, um, so before I get started, can I get a raise of hands? Who has heard of Docker? Great. Who has ran something in Docker? Okay, cool. Good. So um, I'm Tom. I'm Tom Steele. I'm a principal security consultant with Optive Security, so formerly Fishnet and Acumont. Um, and this talk isn't going to be a security review of Docker itself. So we're, there's, no, there's going to be no security research of containers. There's going to be no discussion of how they do isolation and, you know, is it secure? You know, should you run, is it okay to run untrusted code on in a container? Those sorts of things. Those aren't, that's not the topic I'm going to cover. That's a really good topic. If you're interested in that, like that, this, this needs to be researched and needs more people, people's eyes on it. So if you want to talk to me about that, come talk to me afterwards and I can get you in contact with some people. Um, but what it's going to do is it's going to kind of serve as a light introduction to Docker and actually the usability around it. So if you've, been, if you've seen it, you've heard of it, and you're wondering, well, how the heck would I even use that? Um, that's, what, that's what we'll cover here. Um. Okay, and to start right off, to kind of get you maybe hooked a little bit, we're just going to start off with a demo. Okay, so you can see my desktop here. This is uh, just an Ubuntu VM that I have going. And we'll do, uh, you know, which Java? Okay, so I clearly don't have Java installed. But if I want to run burp, I can run burp. Um, so this is burp suite pro running inside of a uh, Linux container, sharing, uh, sharing the, the kernel resources for like X11, and, uh, and it's running all, all inside an isolated environment. Um, and exposing, you know, the proxy port and everything like that. So that's what we're going to work up to. Let's go back. Okay, so what is Docker? Well, what is Docker after all? Um, Docker is basically an abstraction layer built on top of, um, you know, containers. Uh, Linux containers are kind of similar to FreeBSD jails, if you've ever uh, heard of that. It's been described as cheroot on steroids. Um, so conceptually, Docker is a lot like a VM. But technically, it's not at all the same. But conceptually, it is. Um, essentially, what happens when we run Docker is we share the kernel with the host, and we have kind of this separate user land that runs in its own environment, just like you know a GL or, or cheroot would. Um, so, the, but the differences between VMware is if we look at the image on the right, we can see that we have several layers. Um, we have the server, which is you know the, that's your your hardware, the host OS, um, and then you you run your hypervisor, which is you know VMware, VirtualBox, what have you. Uh, and then on top of that, on top of in a VM, you have your guest OS, and then on top of that, you have your standard library, your binaries, and then you would run your application on inside this VM. So you have these, you have this extra layer here. Um, whereas with Docker, we get rid of the hypervisor and we and the guest OS, and we simply replace it with the Docker engine, and then our containers share the host OS's kernel. And they and they and they but they duplicate their user land with the bins and libraries, and you duplicate your application there. This really slide isn't really all that important. It's just kind of funny. I, I, I was searching. I was like, well, I guess it's some images for VMs versus Docker, and um, this is on someone's blog. But this is pretty much true. Um, you know, in a VM, you know, the VMs are typically very large, whereas a, doc, a Docker container is going to be very small. Uh, the startup time of a VM is, you know, you're starting up the OS, so it's a little bit, it's a little bit slower. Whereas the startup of a container, your kernel's already there, so you already booted into OS, you just need to load it. Um, and then integration with the VM, you know, sharing, like VM, um, port forwarding, sharing volumes, uh, you know, sharing file system volumes and things like that is, can be painful. Uh, has anyone ever tried to share a volume uh, to a VM running on Ubuntu with VMware? Does it work all the time? Sometimes. Yeah, it's kind of like this. Uh, and then port forwarding you can do in VMs, but you know, it's, you're configuring it through a UI, it's not very programmable and things like that, so. Okay, but why Docker? Because we have, like I said, Docker's just built on top of kind of existing technologies um, in a way. So why, can't, why, won't you, why don't we just run Linux containers themselves? And also, why even use Docker? Like, why is it important? Why is it relevant to a pen tester? Why would you ever, ever use this? Um, and so I think if we go back two slides and we look at that, and we looked at 
okay, well, we're getting rid of that hypervisor layer. Certainly, if you're building out your architecture and you're like, you know, you're deploying applications to the internet that, that people are going to inherit and use, there's a lot of benefits to Docker because you're going to get more out of your hardware. You don't have that hypervisor layer. But that's not important to us as testers because we don't care. We're not, we don't, we don't actually build anything. We ever, we, all we do is break things, right? So, um, what is, what, why I like using it is because it's easy to share software and it's easy to install software. Um, so, you know, who's ever, who has ever, who has ever, you know, saw a cool tool that's written in Ruby or Python and then you go to download it and the dependencies just won't install? We've all done that. Um, there's, of course, RVM and, and, and things like that to manage those, those things, but that's just another layer on top of your OS. And I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a, I like to have everything clean, so I'm kind of a neat freak. So Docker kind of helps me keep all my dependencies in containers and not have them all over my OS. Um, and you can also upgrade things and, the, and like, like that. So we'll get into that as well. Um, so this is the architecture of Docker. So what it looks like. Um, and so like I said, Linux containers exist outside of Docker. You can certainly run them. But why use Docker at all? Well, Docker gives us a few things. It's, it's like I said, it's basically an abstraction layer on top of, con of just running containers, you know, vanilla. Um, and it gives us some management around the file system, um, process management, image management, network management. So doing things like port forwarding and, like I said, sharing volumes and sharing environment variables and linking them together. So it kind of gives us this whole sort of ecosystem versus just like, a, oh, I just want to run a container in, in its own thing. Um, so stepping through the architecture, we first have the Docker daemon. So Docker daemon is a service that uh, runs all the time, um, listens on a, listens on a port, and it runs on your Linux host. So it only runs on Linux. Um, it might be running on Windows at some point, sometime in the near future, in the new version of Windows Server, but I don't I don't have too many details on that. Um, so that's the first thing. And that's how you interact with Docker. You, you give it commands, and it, and it runs things, and then it gives you the output. The next sort of thing in the Docker architecture are images. We can think of images like a read-only template for a VM, essentially what they are. Um, so what you do is you build it. You can download images, images, or you can build them yourself. And what they are is, is just a template for how you want to start a container. And there's a lot, there's tons of different images. This is basically where the ecosystem comes into play. Um, I can make my own images and share them with you. You can make your own images and share them with me. And we can also pull them from the internet and things like that. So here we have this Ubuntu image and a Redis image. So once we have those images downloaded to our machine, we can then run each of those. We can basically take that image and say, okay, go give me a container running this image. And that image just doesn't, doesn't get touched anymore. It's now a running container, and that's the thing that you interact with. That's the actual thing that runs the code you want to run and the applications that you want to run. And so it's, it, if you can see in this image, if you can see that, uh, it's showing that there's two Ubuntu containers running and two Redis containers running, just showing how that's, that's layered there. And then the next thing is this is how, this is, this is where we actually make the things happen, is using the Docker client. So the Docker client talks to the Docker daemon, and Docker daemon manages those things. And uh, the Docker client itself is very small, very small and lightweight. It's a single binary. And then, and then in the next uh, thing to highlight is the Docker registry. The registry you can run anywhere. You can deploy it yourself. Um, but most people use Docker's uh, hosted registry, which is just on the internet. It's uh, and that is where you can download basically their official images, such as Ubuntu, Nginx, CentOS, uh, and Redis. Or you can also, for free, uh, as long as it's public, you can put up your own images that you've built and host them there. Um, but like I said, you can also run the registry internally yourself. Um, it's just you know, it's it's a little bit, a little bit more involved. So, what does Docker registry look like? This is what the Docker registry looks like. Uh, so this is the official rep repository for Redis. Uh, official means that it's maintained by Docker themselves. Um, it's important, certainly important to remember that when you pull an image off of the Docker registry, you're essentially running something untrusted. Um, I haven't seen anyone talk about this, but I could certainly push an image up there that does something malicious to your machine, and you would have to sort of hope that it's isolated by Docker and the containers, and hope that you don't give it any privileged flags or anything like that. So you're taking that sort of risk. Um, and we'll get, into, we'll get into how you can get around that. Um, but you are taking a little bit of risk there. But with the official repos, 
They're built by Docker. You can probably trust them just about as much as Aptitude or any other package management, in my opinion. So we know that we can, we know what kind of know what images are. We know that we can pull them from uh, from Docker's centralized repository. But what about building our own? That's the most important step: is building able to build our own because. You know, it's, it's, it's not likely that uh, Docker is going to have an official Metasploit uh, uh, image just hosted for you. Um, but how do we build our own? So I kind of stepped through this example of how we would go from wanting to install Recon NG in a container and how we would build that, help how we would build that image. So there's several ways to build the image yourself. Uh, the most easiest way and best way to do it is to write what's called a Docker file. A Docker file is basically just a recipe. Um, with some keywords, so they take key, they just a you know a very small, well documented sub, subset of keywords. So the first one that you give it is this. Uh, oh, and you can't see that. <laughs> Time to improvise. Oh, I can't see that either. All right, we're gonna do this. We're gonna just do it like this. Um, so this first line here that's not gonna be animated is uh, from. So it's it's from, and then you see Python uh, colon two dot seven dot nine. So the way these images work is they're hierarchical. Uh, you can build on, uh, one on top of another. So uh, from what I've done here is I've pull. I'm gonna say okay, from the official repo Python image, I want to use the tag two dot seven dot nine. So it's the Python version. So my image is gonna build on top of this. So it's gonna be pretty lightweight. This image itself. Um, and then this next keyword is maintainer. I'm just telling it's myself. Workter. Basically, when this container is being built, the uh, the, the Docker daemon is gonna change directories into slash root. Run runs a command to build the image. So it's gonna run git clone with the repository. And now that I've got the repository cloned. I'm going to work dirt into that again, into the, into the, the clone repository, and I'm going to run uh, pip install dash r requirements, which installs all the Python dependencies that Recon ng has. And then this next keyword is, is cmd. Uh, cmd, or you know, command, um, that's going to tell the container what it should run by default when you run it. You can override that command, but every time you run the container without any arguments, it's going to just run that for you, and, and, and that's the command it's going to run. Okay, that's just, and then I'm just, this is just a slide showing you that it's, you, by, uh, by example, you call it uh, da, capital D Docker file, and uh, you can just put it in a directory there and then build it. So how we build this is we just, we use the Docker CLI, we do Docker build, dash T adds a tag, so you want to give it a name so that you can easily reference it. So I'm going to call this Tom Steele dash recon ng, and then the location of the Docker file, which is in the same directory. And you'll see it starts running through our commands here. Um, and it's actually running inside of a container, and you can see, like, you know, we get to this pip thing, and it's going to run pip for us, and it's going to install all those dependencies, and it's going to be fine. And, uh, you know, and then you get successfully built. And now you have your image is built. It's not pushed up to the registry for Docker yet. It's actually in your local registry. So it's only local to your machine, but you have now this image ready to go. So when you want to, when you want to use that image, you do docker run dash dash, uh, so yeah, docker run is how you start containers. The dash dash rm flag is important for us as testers because we don't really ever want containers to stick around. We kind of just want to run them and for, like run them once and then be done with it. So that dash dash rm flag makes it so when a docker container is stopped, it's deleted. Um, because if you just stop a container, it actually sticks around. And that's good. You can restart it and things like that. So if you have an application, you can stop and then start. That's good. Um, Dash IT is important because uh, dash I means that we want to keep using standard in, and dash T allocates a pseudo terminal so that we can actually interact with it. Um, and then you give it the name of the image you want to run. So we tagged it as Tom Steele slash Recon NG, and now we can run it. And now we have, uh, you know, Recon NG running in its own isolated environment. No, nothing was installed with pip on our host OS. Very clean. Uh, if it ever you know gets messed up, we just okay it's re rebuild the image and, and go on with our day. So how do we share that? So if I want to share that with you, I would do Docker push 
with the name of my image. Um, and that's gonna, it's gonna authenticate me to Docker here, and it's just gonna push that entire image, it's gonna push up into Docker's uh, repository. So that's one way to do it. It's one way to share it. Um, of course, after it's been pushed, another machine, this, I, hopefully you can see that, but this is Ubuntu, this wasn't on my MacBook, so um, it's a VM. Uh, any, any of you replicating this could do docker pull with the, t with the name of the image, and you can pull that down, and now you have that image too, and you can run it. So you don't have to install any dependencies. Very good way to share software. Uh, of course, a better way to do it, to, to share images, is to use Docker's own infrastructure. So Docker provides, uh, in the registry, a way to do automated builds. Um, and what they do is you give them a repository on GitHub or Bitbucket, a directory within that repository to the location of a Docker file, they will pull down your Docker file. They will run the build process that we looked at two slides ago in their own environment, so um, amongst their clustered environment. And then that Docker image is uh, automatically there. So you can just keep you, know, you can just keep an image up there, and it's uh, it's ready to go. So kind of one of the common things that you'll see is someone will have a repository uh, called Docker files, and you'll just have a set of directories that have, uh, for each tool you'd want to share. So. And then in each of those directories is a Docker file. And so when you go to set an automated build up, you give it a, you give it a repository, and then you give it a Docker file location, and then um, you just you do start build. And eventually, your automated build is up on Docker, and anyone can use it. Um, and now, now it gets to the point where we're talking about running untrusted images. So why, how can you know to trust my image? Um, well, you can see the Docker file. So you can see what it should automatically build. One thing, which I would encourage you to go do, maybe you might want to ask permission first or something, but I'm wondering if there's any way to push an image up and have the Docker file look like that. Because um, you know that's going to be the concern for, for, pe for running untrusted code is, well, I can, you, you say that you can look at the Docker file, but I don't really know that that's the image that the Docker file runs. I don't know all the internal security of their registry, if that's how it works. I assume they've thought about that. They have some very smart people over at Docker, so I'm assuming they've thought of that problem. But it's an interesting one to think about and, and, and look at that I haven't. Um, and of course, if the Docker file is up here and you don't trust pulling the image, you could always download the Docker file yourself and just build it locally. And that would you know, take you a little bit extra time, but it wouldn't be too bad. Um, and then another, th another thing I'll, I'll talk about on this one is that if you do write, if you do like write your, own, your own application and you want to share that with people, one good thing to do with automated builds is you can, trigger, you can make this trigger on a commit. So when you commit code to your app, it can go build a new image for you, and then people can just download that. And, and we'll walk through that a little bit later. Okay, so let's quickly, before we start in the demos, since I'm going to be using OS X, uh, let's quickly talk about Docker on OS X Windows. So, like I said, the Docker daemon only runs on Linux. You can't run it on OS X and Windows yet. Um, so basically what you have to do is you have to run uh, VMware or VirtualBox or some other thing on OS X, and then you run a tiny Linux VM on that, uh, and it's called boot to Docker. And basically all it does is it, that's what it does. It boots and it runs Docker. That's all, that's all it has to do. And then the Docker daemon actually runs on that virtual machine. Um, there's a very good program called Docker Machine. If you want to, if you want to use Docker on OS X, I personally just like using Linux. Um, but if you want to use it on OS X or, or Docker, or Windows, you can use Docker Machine. And Docker Machine automates the creation, destroying, uh, setting up your Docker client to talk to the VMs and everything like that. So kind of think it a little bit like Vagrant if you're familiar with that. Okay, let's uh, jump into the demos. I'm going to minimize this. How's that? Bigger? Okay, we'll go, we'll go bigger. I can do bigger. I mean, bigger, pot. bigger pot. How's that? I can't. I can't see the window. All right. That's is that good? Okay. So like I said, uh, Docker Machine. You need Docker Machine LS. You can see the Docker machines that are running. Um, if you needed to, so uh, Docker uses environment variables to know which daemon to connect to. So you can use Docker Machine to set all that up. So you basically do env and the name of the the name of the machine running, 
and it's going to run all that. So we can just set that up. And now Docker is talking to the VM. So Docker images, this is the command to list all the images that you have. So as you might see, I do have a Metasploit image built. Um, let's go take a look at what that looks like. So this is basically the process that you would have to go through to install Metasploit uh, on Linux, by you know, just a vanilla version of Metasploit. Um, so we do from Ruby and 2.1.6, that's the recommended version. Uh, that's what that's what Metasploit you know recommends you use. We're gonna CD into uh, we're gonna CD into root, add apt update app get upgrade. We're gonna install a bunch of dependencies that it needs. We're then going to download and install nmap. Rose Metasploit depends on nmap for quite a few things. And then we're going to get clone the framework, and um, then we're gonna run bundle install, and everything will just work because. We are not using RVM, we're just using Ruby.2.6. We don't care if we install libraries all over the place because, hey, it's a container, it's an image, it can just go away. This isn't, I don't have to go, you know, reinstall OS X or rebuild my machine if I get, you know, uh, you know, a little, uh, you know, get a little tired of, you know, think, think my, my system's cluttered, anything like that, and then we'll run this command. Um, okay, so one of the other things that we talked about is why Docker is the ability to, um, do things like uh, do net manage networks and do port forwarding things like that. So Docker, the way you do the way you do handle port forwarding and share ports is um, we do Docker run and we're going to do dash rm and dash dash it and then we're going to do p. So this is like you know share the port and uh, we're going to start a handler on port four four three. So we'll just map port four four three to our host to our, our in our container to our host on port four four three. And then we want to give it something, you know, the container or the image name to run. Right? So it's gonna start up the framework. Alright. Let's exploit multi handler set payload windows slash interpreter. Yeah, don't worry about this one. You don't need, this isn't, uh, I'm just getting the IP of my Docker machine. Yeah. And we'll set exit on session false because, you know, we want multiple sessions here. Okay, so our handler's running, so we should be able to talk directly to uh, the container, or we should be able to, talk to basically talk to the Docker host that has that's port, port forwarding the, con the port to the container, and that should just work. And you know we can curl it. So if you're if you're familiar with what, how Metasploit interpreter works, if you don't if you don't give it a correct URI, you basically get what what makes you think it's Apache, and so you need to use your URI. Um, and so. Um, for this demo, I was going to go be like, all right, let's go into Windows and we'll launch a payload. But I thought of something that might, that you guys might think is funny. But, um, so if you've ever, if you ever have anyone on your team that's running a interpreter on the internet and you know where it is, you can mess with them by just doing something like this. Um, just run Apache benchmark against a UI that looks like this. And, uh, yeah, they get pretty messed up. So I think that I, I was giving tips to one of the guys in the pros versus Joes to just run this against all the pros. Um, yeah, just do that a few million times. Scan the internet and do it. It'll be funny. Um, yeah, you can't you can't use that now. Um, okay, so uh, if we actually try to look at this, I can't control C out of this fast enough. I can't get this container to stop. <laughs> so to stop a running container. We can do Docker PS. Oh, we gotta, I'm gonna get set my. And we can see the containers that are running and the, and the ports that they're forwarding. So to stop a container, we just do Docker stop. And uh, you can type out this whole ID or you can just type a little bit of it and we'll figure it out. And, you know, it's gone. 
So our whole thing's got, it's, 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 uh, so, you know, Metasploit's not on my host, so ask, yes, question, sir. When you specify that port forwarding syntax, were you expo uh, exposing your uh, VM to, like, the outside? Yeah, that's the thing with Docker Machine, um, is, so, if you're, if you're on native Linux and you're running Docker, um, doing dash P with the port actually exposes it on your, to, on your global interface. So every, it's gonna, so people can connect it outside. When you're using Docker Machine, you actually are exposing the IP on the VM. So then you have to take it a step further and actually forward the ports using like a TCP proxy. I have something written to do that. So I can hand that out, but yeah. So if you're using Docker Machine, you kind of have to do one more step. But for the sake of this, I was just like, well, I, that's kind of confusing. So we'll just move on. Yes, sir. To update uh, image, like for example, uh, just saw metal flight each day or each week. Uh, I fetch uh, the latest code from the yep. to update. Yeah, essentially all I all. Question, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was. Is, uh, is there a way to update the image? So, so if Metasploit updates each week, how do I make sure my image is updated? And so what I would do is I would just go into the Docker, uh, the Docker registry, and I would just click Start Build, and it would go through that entire Docker file again and rebuild that image, and then I would just do Docker Pull, and I'd have the most updated version of Metasploit. Um, another thing, too, is, is if, um, if you don't want to write a Docker file, you can actually start a container, do all your install steps, and then save that running container as an image. Um, so you don't have to go do the Docker file. The Docker file is just sort of the best way to do it because you have a template that you can edit and modify, and it's a little bit easier to test with too. Um, yeah, right, right, right. Um, okay, so we talked about port forwarding. Let's talk quickly about sharing files. So by default, your container doesn't have access to anything on your host system except for you know that kernel interface that's built. Um, but you know, sharing files is the thing that you want to do, especially with like Metasploit and Recon NG. If you want to run export or something, you have to be able to get that. Um, you want to be able to get that data off of that container and into your own, into you, it, to you. So I'm just going to show you how to do that just with a flat Ubuntu um, a, a container. So you do dash it or dash I, dash it. You use the dash v flag, and then you use a full path to the directory you want to share. So I'm just going to share this Metasploit directory. And then colon and where you want to map it to the container. So I use it as data, and I run Ubuntu and the command I want to run. And now when I go to slash data, I can see my Docker file living on the host. So that's how we can share data across our host OS to our containers and back and forth. Can you do that with the Docker running? If you have already started it, can you add it retroactively, or do you have to initialize that? I don't think you can, but let me know if I'm wrong. I, I could be, they keep adding new features, so it, like, certainly you didn't used to be able to do that, but you can't, you, you kind of can. Um, but one thing you can do, and that's a good point, is you, on a running container, you can do, uh, so I'll just, I need, I need Docker PS. So on a running container, you can do Docker exec, and the container ID. Dash IT. So I've had this happen. I had this happen to me before, where I was running, basically running Recon NG in a container, and I had done all this research, and then I had all this data, and I forgot to map a drive, and I was kind of like, "Well, do it all over again." Um, but you can use Docker exec, and then once you're, so I'm, I'm in the same container. But you could, pro what, what I did end up doing is just installing SSH server, and then figuring out, and then getting into another container, and then jumping to that, and then. Kind of doing it. It's, it's turtles all the way down, man. You can, it's fine. Um, so yeah, just you can exec into it, install SSH, or you know, if install SSH, just just the client, and then SCP the files back to yourself, something like that. So yeah, that's how I would handle it. I don't. I would. I'd be interested to see if you could map a map a share to a running container. I don't think you can, but I won't say that you can't. Um, okay, next demo. Not on your host. What was the question? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, guys. Uh, the question was, in, cre in, the, in the image creation, can you have it automatically map a drive? You can have it map a volume that is shared across con other containers, but you cannot map something on your host OS. Um, so one of the things that I'm not going to get into here, because it's kind of like, it's not 
really, you kind of, it's just kind of, there's so many different variables you could get across. But the cool stuff too is when you start um, creating containers that can talk to other containers. And that's the sort of thing where you can share volumes across containers. You can map ports to different containers based on environment variables. So one thing that would that would be interest, you know, that would be good to do is if you were running the Metasploit container, for instance, and you wanted to attach a Postgres database, how do you do that? Well, what you'd want to do is start the Postgres, use the Postgres image, start it in a container, share, and then share like a database uh, dot, you know, dot the, the database YAML file to the Metasploit container with the environment variables from the Postgres container and link them together. And then they'd be able to talk to each other, and you can have you know containers kind of talking to each other. And that's that's basically where Docker goes gets really awesome um, for infrastructure wise, because you know you can just you know if you're running if you're if you're writing some application and you, and, and you know you know and you, you have a database and you have maybe a, a caching layer, you can just put the containers up on the server. You don't have to worry about ops going and having to deploy you know install processes and update those things. It's mostly just like okay, you got a new version of the app. Well, it's just replace the app container and keep the database container running and pretty much good to go. Um, so we so we talk, so we kind of so, so that's kind of like you know running standard tools. The other thing that, that that makes Docker cool, like I said, is the ability to share software. So a couple of weeks ago I was just messing around one night and um, who's used Veil framework? It's awesome. We've all used probably all used Veil. Um, it's a way to, to it basically automates generating payloads. Um, uh, that you can execute on, you know, victim machines. Uh, and it has a JSON, RP, uh, JSON RPC API, so you can communicate with it remotely. So I thought, so I was like, I like building web apps. I pretty much just put a web app on everything and call it a day. Um, I was like, well, I'll build a web app that talks to the JSON RPC API, and then we can just hit the server somewhere on the somewhere on our, in our lab, and I can generate payloads through like a, you know a form, and that'll be easier. Uh, so that's what I did. I built that. And then I was like, okay, so how do I share this with, with everyone on my team? And we'll look at the Docker files, see kind of how involved it is to install. So first thing, you know, the, 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 this, this HTTP API uh, needs is it needs a bunch of environment variables set up. And so in the Docker file, we can set default environment variables that are overridable when you run the container. So for instance, we want to tell it where our Veil listener is, so where the Veil API is. So okay, so you'd have to start that yourself. You'd have to set up an output directory yourself. You'd have to set the server listener yourself to where it's going to listen to. And then we have admin user and admin pass. Now admin pass, you probably want to change. Um, but by default, we'll just set it as secret because that's what we do. Um, so, but you can, but you know, the idea is that in the documentation, I know it says that you should override that and set a secure password, uh, whatever. Uh, and then. Um, the next step is you have to install Node.js because I wrote a uh, client-side only UI that you have to compile with uh, with a, with a, you know a framework and everything like that. So you have to install that. You have to go install Go. You got to restore Go and make sure it works with uh, Veil. Then you have to build the client. So you have to go run npm and build the client. You have to make a bunch of directories, and you have to. I just created a startup script. So if you want to do if you wanted to install my thing outside of Docker, basically I have install instructions for you to go through and run all these things. And then you'd have to go start Veil, and then you'd have to basically hook them up. It's a little bit of an involved process. Certainly not something that you see some guy wrote something on Friday night and you just want to run it and see what it's like. You don't want to go through all these processes and you know, install all these things on your, own, on your own machine. So what I did was I basically you know, used that Docker file to share an image, and we'll run that. We don't need to use IT. Okay, so um, an, an image like this, you might actually not want to do RM. You might want to run dash D, which will run the process that gets started inside the container as a daemon. So it'll just always be running our machine. So we'll use dash D. We know that this thing exposes port 80, so we're going to map it to port 8080 on our box. Um, and then we want to what we want to run. It's too many E's. And now it should be running. Okay. So we will grab this IP. And 
And so this is the Veil of HTTP API. I can run through this. It's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool. So say we want to generate a Go, interpret HTTP payload. We go get the option. We'll just give it this IP, 443. Do generate. And it downloads our payload. That's pretty cool. Um, but you know, this is this is just a little day thing in itself. But certainly, you can think to yourself if you want to just go see what I was doing, you probably don't want to go install that whole thing and get it running. You probably just want to pull down the image and run it and be like, okay, that's cool. Um, and so that's how we actually deploy things. We just deploy containers and it's good to go. Um, so that is that. Okay. So now let's get a little more advanced here. So in the beginning, we saw that I don't have Java installed on this on this machine. I don't want to install Java. I just want to run burp. Um, so how did I do it? Let's step through the commands. So we use docker run, dash it, dash rm, we're familiar with. I then want to map volumes. So I want to map my Java preferences file for burp so that I don't have to keep, uh, basically, I don't want to license it every, I don't want to hit their licensing server every time and exceed my allowed numbers. Don't abuse this. Burp is really cheap. So if you like run this on a bunch of machines because you can abuse it, that's kind of a dick move, but that's okay. I mean, yeah, don't do that. Um, and then, uh, and then, uh, I want to map any extensions I have. So I use a lot of burp extensions. We probably all do. And so I just keep them in a file called, a folder called extensions and I map that on the container to extensions. And then I want to map just a general directory where I have burp and also ma map a directory so I can like do something like save my burp state because you know there's that's what you want to do when you're working on a web app is you want to save your state you don't want to just delete that file or whatever um, so and then you want to be able to share states files and things like that now we have to be using the UI so we have to share the UI we have to share x11 so what we do is we we do dash v and we share our x11 unit you know our socket there our socket file there with temp and then we have to inside the container set the display environment variable to our display environment variable and then this next command dash dash net host what this does is every single port that is listening in the container is now listening on my host os if you are in security and you have developers or operations teams that are doing this option, just just tell them not to do it because you shouldn't do this. You should only do this when you're just you know messing around yourself on your you know you you should know what you're doing here. You're basically sharing every single port, uh, and, and so if that thing gets compromised, it's not good. Um, but you know here we're just we know we're running burp. So um, the reason I did this and not just uh, you know dash p eighty eighty for instance is because. Uh, I like to run some extensions that listen on services too. So I have one in particular called Burp Buddy, which like is it puts an HTTP API on top of Burp that you can use. So I like to have that available. Um, dash dash name Burp. So you know how we kept interacting with containers via ID. This lets us interact with them via a you know canonical name. So we can just call it Burp. Um, and then we're going to use the Java image, and we're going to run uh, we're going to run you know Java dash jar. And then the location of our mapped burp file. So the mapped, the burp, you know, the burp suite jar isn't in, isn't in our container. It's, we're going to map it via a share. <laughs> and you can do that. Yeah. And then, you know, there you go. Um, so we can come in here and, uh, I'm going to preference. Uh, I'll show you this real quick. So if we run, try to make that bigger. If we run net stat, sudo net stat plnt. Um, you know, we can see that Java is listing on a bunch of ports from our burp container on our on our host OS. This is cool. So then, come to settings. Set eighty. Firefox, and then we'll just do like Google.com. I don't have internet connection, but you can see our proxy now works. So we're running burp inside of a container. Um, what's cool about this is you could go and run a single burp instance for like maybe every client you're working on, and then save that work, so that you can keep you can for sure keep everything segregated. Um, 
Yeah. Um, and then what I can't get working because uh, Firefox doesn't let you set the proxy through a command line utility, but you could do it with Chrome, is I have a Firefox container. And so I was trying to like do linking and then map them together. But like this is, oh, something to it. Oh boy. Oh, okay. All right, I see you. Uh, yeah, don't override entry point. So I was trying to get this talking to burp through environment variables and stuff, but Firefox doesn't let you run with a proxy command, but you could do this with Chrome. And so you could basically decide not to expose any of burp's, burp's ports to your host OS, just expose them to Docker, and then you could have another container that could talk to that one and use those ports. But like I said, Firefox doesn't work like that. So you could build your own Firefox image, but I didn't want to do that either. Um, it's probably just easier to run Firefox. You already have it installed, so it's kind of just you're kind of just going overkill at that point. Uh, I guess that's all I have for demos. I want to leave a bit of a time for questions and answers. You got any questions? Yes. Oh, okay. If you want to use the mic, you can. If you don't, I'll repeat it. Try. Um, you said that it was um, just as reliable to download something from the Docker repository as it is from like the um, Ubuntu repository. But isn't there some kind of vetting that goes on with the Ubuntu repository? No, 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 no. So, so yeah, I I possibly overspoke there. Uh, certainly, the aptitude repositories are going to be prob most likely more secure than uh, the official repositories for Docker. I'd imagine that I don't know the security processes around Ubuntu's repositories. Um, it's probably better than what Docker's internal security team has at this point, but I don't know. Um, there is signing that's it, it's there's signing in place, but it's not really enforced yet in the Docker image. So you'll see, like if you do, if you download an image, it will say like it'll give you the signature, but it will basically say it's not verified. So they haven't built that in yet, but that's something that they're going to do. So. Oh yeah, you can push anything you want. So yeah, that's the thing is like. I trust, I typically tend to trust the official repos. Um, but if it's just, you know, uh, Bob slash, uh, you know, uh, you know, Bob slash Firefox, I might not trust that. I might just go ahead and download his Docker file and inspect it and build it myself. Yeah. Yeah. So the images can basically have anything they want. Sir? Do you have a link to like, your Docker files so we can take a look at? Yeah. They're, uh, yeah, they're, so they're in github.com slash Tom Steele, and then you'll see Docker files. Um, also, if you want more of this type of thing and seeing like the crazy things that you can do with containers on your client machine, there's an awesome person who works at Docker uh, herself. Her name is Jessie, and she has thousands of Docker files for like everything, Spotify, Skype, and she's given a lot of talks like these. Um, that are much better than mine. One's called, I think it's called like the Willy Wonka of containers, and it's just kind of, it's just kind of, she's, she's very talented, and it's, uh, you should go watch those if, you, if you're interested in this sort of thing. Is it what? I don't know how to pronounce her last name. Uh, it's like Frizzell or something, but uh, if you just go search Jess on Docker, that should pop up, or you search Jess Docker on YouTube, a lot of her talks should pop up. Yes? You know, that's that's something I, I didn't look for. Um, I know in particular there's Kali, so that's one of the things I didn't get into is there's a Kali image. So if you do from Kali, you have access to all their repos, so you can just go install the tools. Like if you wanted to go through an easier route to get Metasploit, you can do from Kali and then just do app get update, app get uh, upgrade, app get install, Metasploit, and it will pull it from Kali's repos too. But uh, yeah, I don't know if there's uh, any, any vulnerable web apps. I know there's a, I know there's a lot of cool ones for uh, fuzzing. So like I think like American Fuzzy Lop, there's a container for that too. So like getting, because sometimes getting all that stuff set up is kind of a pain. But uh, yeah, good idea. There's the D DBWA uh, container. Oh, okay. So there you have it. There's a uh, damn vulnerable uh, uh, web apps or whatever. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and it's an awesome way to share things that you don't, that you typically share through a VM um, and make them a lot smaller. So. 
Any other, if there's no other questions, um, I'll just say thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs>